Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things, in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more. But getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of ocean so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. We also need to set aside areas for protection and research even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me.
they don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. 
the sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes, hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu, or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. 
These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Hello, distinguished guests, and welcome to Aquarium Bright. Here, you will get to see the most dangerous sea and ocean creatures. But don't let what I said mislead you. It's very well possible for you to come across one of these underwater animals during a walk on the beach. So take a look at them carefully now, and you might just avoid a disaster. Is it fish or is it stone? What you're looking at is commonly known as the stonefish. But its fancier names include the Dornorn and the Sinancia. If you're into diving and observing the underwater, you might already have come across one without noticing. Its appearance makes it almost impossible to distinguish it from a real stone due to its gray coloration and mottled appearance, especially if you're wearing fogged snorkel goggles. So you better pay attention because otherwise, the consequences can be unfortunate since stonefish are the most venomous fish known. Although some types of stonefishes are known to live in rivers, and most of them are found in coral reefs near the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans. Their needle-like dorsal fin spines stick up when they're disturbed or threatened and inject the poison they contain. The most common reason why stonefish stings occur is swimmers stepping on them without realizing it. However, you don't need to be in the water to get stung. 
Since they can survive out of the water for up to 24 hours, you'll have to watch where you step when you're at the beach as well. Those who got stung by stonefish describe their experience to be extremely distressing. Their venom can result in infection, and in some cases, it is known to cause shock and paralysis. It might come as a bit of a shock, but despite its bad reputation, stonefish is edible if it's prepared properly. When the fish is heated, its venom breaks down. And if the dorsal fins, which are the main source of its venom, are removed, raw stonefish is served as part of sashimi too. This creature might look like it came out of a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. Say hello to the blue-ringed octopuses. Don't be deceived by their small size, which can range between 5 to 8 inches including their arms, because they're packed with venom to cause great damage to as many as 26 people within minutes. Just like stonefishes, blue-ringed octopuses are found in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. They typically live on coral reefs and rocky areas of the seafloor. Some may also be found in tide pools, seagrass, and algal beds. Blue-ringed octopuses are not aggressive in nature. When they're not seeking food such as crabs or shrimps, or searching for a mate, they often hide in marine debris, shells, or crevices. It's only if they're provoked, cornered, or handled that they get dangerous to humans. When they're threatened, they turn bright yellow or blue iridescent rings appear all over their body as a warning display towards the potential predators. Their bites usually come unnoticed, so you might not be able to realize you're bitten until it's too late. The venom of a blue-ringed octopus can cause dizziness and loss of senses and motor skills, and ultimately, paralysis. So, better try to keep your hands to yourself and back away in a hurry if you see one. Nope, it's not a flower bouquet, so don't try to pick and smell one of those pink tube-like things. What's standing before your eyes is a marine animal called a flower urchin. It may look gorgeous, but don't let the looks deceive you. It was named the most dangerous sea urchin in the 2014 Guinness World Records. Flower urchins inhabit the tropical areas of the Indo-West Pacific and are found among coral reefs, rocks, sand, and seagrass beds at depths of 0 to 295 feet. The most noticeable feature of them is their pedicularia, which are claw-shaped defensive organs that are also found in sea stars. What makes flower urchins differ from any other sea urchin is the fact that their pedicularia is, as the name suggests, flower-like, and usually pinkish-white to yellowish-white in color, with a central purple dot. Hidden underneath those flowers, they possess short and blunt spines. Although many sea urchins deliver their venom through such spines, flower urchins deliver their venom through their pedicularia, or flowers. If they're undisturbed, the tips of these flowers are usually expanded into round, cup-like shapes. On their surface, they possess tiny sensors with which they can detect threats. And once they contact such threats, these flowers immediately snap shut and start injecting venom. What's weird is that the little claws of the flowers can sometimes break off from their stalks, stick to the point of contact, and continue injecting venom for hours into whoever touched it. Yeesh! Looks like a giant puddle of melted strawberry ice cream, right? You wish! It's a lion's mane jellyfish, which is also called giant jellyfish, arctic red jellyfish, or hairy jelly. They're known to prefer cool water. That's why they can mostly be found in the Arctic, northern Atlantic, and northern Pacific Oceans. But it's possible to spot them around the British Isles or in the Scandinavian waters too. Lion's mane jellyfish are one of the largest known species of jellyfish. They get their name from their long, flowing hair-like tentacles and can reach lengths up to 10 feet. And although the average bell diameter of a lion's mane jellyfish is around 20 inches, they can sometimes attain a diameter of over 7 feet. The largest lion's mane jellyfish recorded was seen in 1865 off the coast of Massachusetts. It was measured to have tentacles around 125 feet long and a diameter of 7 feet. To help you picture it, this is longer than a blue whale. Lion's mane jellyfish hunt by extending their tentacles outward and creating a trap to catch their food. Since they have around 1,200 stinging tentacles, the fish would have to be extremely lucky to be able to escape them. 
The sting of a lion's mane jellyfish is usually not life-threatening, but you would still want to avoid swimming into its tentacles because it can be very painful to humans. And if you see one washed up on the beach, better not touch it because it can still deliver a sting long after they've been on the shore. Fun fact, the lion's mane jellyfish appears in the Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of the Lion's Mane, as a suspect. But don't worry, we won't give you any spoilers. The last marine animal you're seeing now is a sea snake, and yes, they are different from eels. There are 69 identified species of sea snakes. Most of them can be found in the tropical and subtropical waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they have been around for millions of years. To make things easier, scientists have separated all different species of sea snakes into two categories, true sea snakes and sea crates. Whereas true sea snakes spend almost all their time at sea, sea crates can spend some time on land as well. If you see a snake on the beach, you can tell whether it's a land or sea snake by looking at its tail. If it's paddle-like, then that's a sea snake you got there, but make sure to keep your distance in both cases. All sea snakes need to surface regularly to breathe since they have no gills. That's why you can come across one while swimming. If that happens, you better swim away as fast as you can because most sea snakes have more venom than the average cobra or rattlesnake. However, since they only attack if provoked, bites are quite rare. One more cool fact about sea snakes, they are the only reptiles to give birth in the oceans. The majority of sea snakes keep the eggs within themselves and give birth to nearly fully formed snakes while swimming. That's except for the yellow-lipped sea crate though. They come onto land to lay eggs of their little ones. Remember the stonefish from the beginning of our tour? They're hunted by sea snakes. Blame the food chain.